Welcome to the AI First Business Podcast with Tina Yazdi, where we show you how teams, companies, and leaders are turning AI hype into ROI. Good morning, Sven, although it's like 11 a.m. <laughs> Hi, Tina. Hi, Sven. Just want to give a quick intro about Dr. Sven Youngman, kind of what he does and what brought him to this episode today. So the description from your LinkedIn is machine olfactioned founder, CEO, doctor turned entrepreneur who brings together business strategy, evidence-based medicine and technology. And just to give a little bit of context to support that Dr. Youngman is pushing the boundaries of healthcare. He is really redefining what it means to be a doctor today. In his pursuit of sustainable, affordable, um, effective and equitable healthcare, he has combined his background as a physician, which includes degrees in public health and policy from Oxford and Cambridge, and being a visionary entrepreneur. With this rare combo, he's co-founded Halitus. Did I pronounce that right? Mm -hmm. Where he currently leads the development of cutting edge breath analysis devices for disease screening. We're going to talk a little bit about why that's such a difficult problem to solve. And by combining his work in artificial intelligence and machine learning with digital health, Dr. Youngman understands what it takes to navigate the intersection of healthcare and technology. Dr. Youngman, welcome. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a couple of quotes that I wanted to share to mm -hmm. frame this episode that I found on stuff that you liked on LinkedIn. One quote is about slightly biased prediction of where healthcare is headed Ooh. next from Adrian Ayun, who's the founder of Forward, which is a telehealth company. He said recently, slowly but surely, we are just migrating every single thing mm -hmm. from doctor and nurse to hardware and software. In fact, we don't even believe a doctor's office should exist. So that's like a really clear point of view. Um, there's a post by Dr. Wichter, um, I'm going to skip his last name because I'm That's worried it. I'm going to mess it up, regarding feelings of guilt for people transitioning out of the medical clinical side of things. Right. And his post said, we need individuals who are brave enough to leap into the unknown and continually reinvent themselves. If you are among those who really want to make a difference to humanity, you are urgently needed outside the bedside too. And I cannot think of a better individual that fits this description than yourself. Please. So over to you. Can you maybe tell us a little bit about your story and also Halitus and what you guys are up to there? Yeah, with pleasure. So maybe first of all, the, the first quote, um, and I guess you and I share a similar sentiment, right? Is of course exaggerated, um, but uh, mm -hmm. there there is a strong tendency of uh, changing the center of gravity from the traditional healthcare brick and mortar system into every the everyday life of people, and it's for for various good reasons, and and we can do it now thanks to data. And secondly, I believe mm -hmm. that what I still hear a lot from my colleagues is that they always think we just need to throw more bodies at the problem. We just need more doctors and more nurses, and it's going to be fine. But there are mm -hmm. fund first of all, it's not going to happen because we're not going to have these people. And secondly, um, it doesn't solve all the problems. If you just, it's going to be incremental innovation, but we fundamentally have to change some things. And and I think yeah, thinking about what is it that we can turn into hardware and software, bring closer to people's lives, etc., is, is something that's really close to my heart. And so for myself, I started my career in medicine, realized quite early that I would not really want to grow old at the bedside, partially because I felt I can have a much higher impact elsewhere. It's, I mean, you know, it, it's beautiful if you have the time to properly be with a patient and have that one-on-one -on -one setting. Often it's not so beautiful because the, you're so restricted that you can't really do what you, what you wanted to do. But at the same time, it does not scale, right? There's only so many people you can help. And most of the healthcare systems that I have seen, I felt were hugely inefficient. So you, you waste a lot of your own lifetime doing things that you don't even need to study for. Uh, while everybody is wondering, where's the doctor? Why am I not seeing a doctor? And the truth is, well, the doctor is trying to find printer paper to get a fax sent that yeah. he or she can then type off into a computer. And so these things are just hugely frustrating. And I wanted to create a system that would make me want to work in it. So my first stint was, um, or my first attempt was trying to go to public health policy. Felt like I'm not going to find a spot where I can really be outcome driven and really make a change because it's too politicized quite often. And then this covered the whole world around entrepreneurship and digital health as something where it's your job to be disruptive and to be the odd one out and where you can. The beautiful thing about AI and digital and so on is, and it goes back to the quote, is that you cannot just reduce 
inefficiencies, but you can fundamentally change the way we go about things, right? From reactive to proactive, from decentral, or centralized to decentralized, et cetera. And can I just make a ask yeah. a question about just before we move on? You said that on one hand, it is a beautiful thing if you have the capacity yeah. and resources to spend the time that you'd like to and you feel need to spend at the bedside with, with patients. But on the other hand, it's not scalable. Just maybe jumping ahead a little bit. Yeah. Are, are those things mutually exclusive or do they actually necessitate each other? Like you cannot free up doctor time unless you actually make things more scalable. I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are. Yeah, that's so true. Even the moments when you really have undisturbed undis FaceTime with your patient, mm -hmm. even there, you're wasting a lot of time. Because for example, you, you keep explaining the same things. Like if you're in oncology, you keep okay. telling everybody, if you have a fever, cough, or something like that, come to the emergency room, don't don't wait it out. And then you explain that over and over again. And that could just be mm -hmm. an online video that you just display, like things that are completely <laughs> normal everywhere else. We're just not doing mm -hmm. it, right? So absolutely, yeah. absolutely right. And I have another question just before we move on. Mm -hmm. What I skipped mentioning, because there was already so much to cover about mm -hmm. your background. You actually were in the military as well. Is that, yeah. is that right? Oh, yeah. um, just out of curiosity, does that military background um, have some influence, do you think, on your focus on being outcome driven? Um, because I'm guessing oh. the military is quite outcome driven. I don't know. I've never been in the military, to be honest it's, with you, it's, but it's a, it's it a seems very, that way to me. It's a very smart and beautiful question. You know, I think the um, what they have in common is you can't really bullshit yourself or others, right? But there's no PowerPoint where you can show something. There's, there's no... <laughs> spreadsheet that you can massage like in, you know, in the, the military, military you say guns don't lie right yeah in medicine you also yeah. say bodies don't lie right there, there is something that's fundamentally real and and you will see if your patient's getting better or not you will see if your platoon survives or not it's 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 very straightforward if you're up in the mountains mm -hmm. and you don't know how to tie the knots you don't know how to navigate you are in deep deep trouble right so people are right. from day one going to be very real with you very um very focused on really knowing what they're doing um, mm -hmm. uh, and that, yeah, definitely. The, the only thing that matters is the outcome. I mean, of course, right. you have to be ethical on the way to it, but there's no excuse for not making it. And we are going to talk about the ethical side of things. Mm -hmm. And can you share a little bit more, maybe we can go into Halitus specifically, because not only mm -hmm. are you combining different disciplines that don't often enough get combined, but you're working on a problem that's been historically very difficult to solve on top of that. Breath as a diagnostic modality, if you want to think of it like that, is, mm -hmm. is ancient. You know, Galen used to smell uh, on, on patients on, on, on the exhalation, on urine and so on. This was a very normal part. And over the time we lost it because, you know, the sense of smell is also vulnerable. You can get germs that, that you inhale. You can have sure. chemicals that might harm you. And also it's very subjective. We don't have a really good language for quantifying smell. Uh, it's very metaphorical when we talk about it. And so it's something that, that we lost a little bit. Right. And people have been trying to technologize it for quite a while, mostly using very sophisticated lab gear, such as gas chromatography with mass spectrometry, etc. That's cool. But then the problem is, how do you how do you sample breath, you know, you, that people blow into what's called a Tedla bag or some mask, and then that you ship that in, there's a high risk of getting contamination with other things. It's it's very high dimensional data with a lot of markers. You exhale more than a thousand molecules with each breath. Then your breath can depend on what you ate, right. if you did a workout or not, uh, if you have asthma and, and, and all of that. And many of these markers that you exhale, they come from your bloodstream into the lung, then get exhaled. Some of them are really tightly bound to the lung, others not so much. So the ones that are tied to the lung, if you're sitting upright, you will exhale less. If you lie down, your upper parts of the lung get more blood, so there is more surface, and then it looks like you're exhaling more. But really, it, it's just the basic dynamics of, of that molecule. And so, and so there's, there's a lot of things that, that make so it really, So you really see really this hard. problem, and you're like, that's my thing. I want to figure this out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, not just me. Like, what I love is when you have something where you read, need a lot of different disciplines to look at it, right? From mm -hmm. like engineering to machine learning to the medical side, and it's a physiology topic. And if you don't really yeah. understand the, the whole perspective from a first principles mm -hmm. perspective, it's not gonna work really well, I think. A lot of people just try to throw AI at it and then let it solve it by itself. And, and I don't see that this is the right promising way to get that sorted. Um just on that note, do you have an example of maybe something that you've seen in the market? We don't have to name names. 
Mm -hmm. um, but a problem in healthcare that had AI thrown at it, um, but the outcome wasn't quite what yeah, was yeah. hoped for. So, um, for example, there, there there was a company that tried to um, to, de to to measure your blood glucose based on superficial tension or sweat or whatever that was in on the surface so that that you would not even have to have a, a small needle like the continuous glucose measurement devices and they could mm -hmm. show that when people drink a coke or some other sugary drink that it would actually go up but then uh, in real life it didn't work out so there was something else that connected it that the thing measured which had nothing to do with the actual blood glucose but where there was some sort of an association so i'm i'm actually not really familiar with the whole details but i know of one investor who was pretty frustrated so it was like a correlation not causation kind of exactly yeah misinterpretation yeah and only in a very certain setting and then in other settings then it, it didn't replicate of course because there was no real causation got it it sounds like you are solving actually a cluster of problems at the same time yeah. It starts with the discipline around sampling and trying to find a process that can be scaled for yeah. patients that may not even have a doctor present from that side of things. You guys are also building the device to analyze this. You're also navigating um, the healthcare permissions and licenses and regulations to fit something new mm -hmm. into something approvable that can be taken to market legally. Also using AI and machine learning as another layer to kind of like marry the data from the sample with the analysis mm -hmm. side. Can you walk us through like what are all the different components that your team is yeah. working on and what like the ideal outcome of this would look like? What would change in healthcare if this was something that could be scaled across like hospitals around the world or mm. doctor's offices around the world? No, beautiful. Maybe the last question first, if I may. So the one problem, for example, we're trying to solve is that at the moment, if you are a high risk patient for lung cancer, Mm -hmm. um, which typically is the case if you reach a certain age and you smoked a lot, then uh, you should be getting, according to the US guidelines, a CT scan every year. And that, depending on what study you look at, is only done in 6% of the high-risk cases. So you can call that a, a screening failure, effectively. And the, the reason is because it's hard to schedule an extra appointment, so you have to go back. And it's also radiating, so many people don't want to do it costly, potentially, et cetera. And the idea yeah. is what if the key decisions could be made in, the, in this one singular first meeting with your GP or your lung doctor who previously would send you first to somebody else to get that CT scan done. So you, you're basically right. giving them more, a bigger part of that value chain. And we believe if, for example, you would implement the breath test into the standard lung function test that people have to do anyway when they have lung diseases, and these people often are at higher risk, especially in COPD, then you could easily get from 6% to 50 to 60%, I suppose, in terms of screening uptake. And, and that would be dramatic. You could imagine similar things for other things. These biomarkers that you can find in the breath have been associated in very rigorous studies with a lot of different diseases. And, and these diseases range from all sorts of cancers, ovary cancer also, to neurodegenerative diseases, oh. infectious diseases, and autoimmune. So there's, there's a broad range of things you could potentially detect and the biggest problem was just how do you get it? Like you said, Tina, how do you get it to the point of care in a cheap and fast and easy to use way? And, and so that, that's, okay. I mean, the way we're trying to solve it is by using industrial lasers that can detect okay. like small molecules. There are other approaches, which I think are also valid, electrochemical sensors and so on. And maybe at some point there's a point in fusing them together or whatever. And we're partnering really closely with another company out of the US that has created an interesting machine learning layer that we're working on together also to really make most of that data that is being collected. And there you have big topics around signal to noise ratio management because the molecules okay. we're looking for, they are particles per billion, particles per trillion concentrations. So you're really, really trying to find the needle in the haystack. Dogs can do that. Uh, some humans can do that apparently. Um, but uh, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's this woman that could smell that her uh, partner was developing Parkinson's and she has like in some hyperosmia and they've been doing studies with her. But, you know, you, you want to have something that you can kind of quantify and, and people can't mm -hmm. really quantify smell so well. So, yeah, with that, you end up having a, a really interesting uh, tech stack that is high performing for signal to noise ratio management, for putting in different uh, molecules at the same time. That's the next mm -hmm. thing about breath. So you don't have this one biomarker 
that is associated with one disease, it's often elevated or depressed because right. of different things. So you need to look at a subset, like a, choose your top seven, top 12, top 15 markers mm -hmm. and then analyze them in conjunction to really make sense of it. And that's also an interesting machine learning challenge because it would just probably completely exceed human capabilities of, of properly making sense of such a data set. And then you have a strong explainability layer. But sorry, please go. On the last episode I recorded, it, Karthik from Armilla AI, they do insurance uh, for AI algorithms. Mm -hmm. they, they insure the systems. And Karthik shared that for many organizations, the hardest part of the process of building an ethical, reliable AI system is establishing a ground truth. Oh, yeah. At the beginning, um, which kind of you alluded to there, which is never mind like collecting the data and getting the data into something that you can analyze, but it sounds like establishing a ground truth of like what mm. is enough to look for, what should we look for? Can you share a little bit more about how do you um, navigate that in healthcare? Yeah. So um, you need a clinical partner that is good. And uh, okay. in our case, so it's, it's a hospital that um, uh, has access to patients at risk for lung cancer and uh, they are going or where well, there's suspected lung cancer even and are going into a lung biopsy and then you compare these people who have a biopsy confirmed diagnosis with mm -hmm. uh, those who don't and then you compare their breath and the way we do it so the term we like to use often in medicine is that gold standard so what's the what is the number one way of analyzing of detecting diagnosing a disease and it, you might have a clinical gold standard. In that case, that's right. the biopsy. You would also, of course, look at some other data and what the clinician finally gives as a diagnosis. And then you can have an analytical gold standard, which is gas chromatography with mass spectrometry, where it just basically sequences the whole breath and looks at mm -hmm. all the molecules that are in there. And it's very sensible to, to compare both. And there's one big problem is that sometimes people say, well, actually, there is not really a gold standard because none of these tests mm -hmm. have hundred percent. So it's more like a copper standard. And in theory, <laughs> if, right, if, if you only measure yourself against one gold Cynical. standard, as we are, um, copper is beautiful though, and uh, you can do a lot. But the problem is if you, in theory, if let's say the gold standard is 98% sensitive and you are 99%, mm. then the gold standard will tell you you're wrong in this 1% where you're actually more right. So you have yeah. to figure out how, what can I do to triangulate and to get more data to also give evidence where I'm better that I was right and not the previous gold standard. So th yeah. that's often a little bit of a challenge. And that's where, you know, like having a, a, a broad ground truth that also includes maybe other diagnostics. And then in the end of the day, a synthesis made still by a human that annotates it can, can be the, the right way forward. They say that a score of 10 out of 10 is for God nine out of 10 is for professors and eight out of 10 is for students. <sighs> how long have you been working on um, Halitus for? Uh, it's, I think it's like two and a half years now. Two and a half years? Something like that, um, My question is in these two and a half years, what would you say were your top three challenges and mm. were any of them not expected? I mean, this is probably a boring answer, but what surprised me the most was how hard it was to fundraise for this and people just... Right hate hardware passionately there's a lot of investors just they, they just don't as soon as you have atoms in your business model they're out and that, that was that was really surprising and even people where you would think but but you come from that world and i mean germany makes a lot of money with atom based businesses why are we completely trying to, to leave that you know so many med tech companies that was a bit surprising also and you alluded to it right so in the beginning maybe a bit naively i thought there's a lot of value in creating that device and proving that it works and just going mm -hmm. through that R&D journey, the bar is much higher. They, especially also okay. investors, they will ask you, okay, but what's your go-to-market strategy? What are the price points? You really have to think the whole thing through because if you don't, you're doing risk stacking. So that means there is the R&D risk, there's a regulatory approval risk, there is your reimbursement risk, there's an adoption risk, there's et cetera. And these risks don't just stack up with one plus two plus three. It's like risk A times risk B times risk C. And um, yeah. it, absolutely. And that's something that I underestimated because I, I felt, you know, in, in, in many of the pharmaceutical world, you, you're doing, you, you test a new compound, you do your preclinical study or maybe phase one, and, and that's where you already exited, right, to some big company. And then they take over the okay. rest and, and they calculate sort of the risk out of it. But yeah, I think in MedTech, that's a bit bit more demanding. 
I, in the end of the day, it's also more demanding in pharmaceuticals, but I, you know. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Uh, do, you, do you want to maybe um, share a quick summary of how you got where you are? Good. Uh, so started in the army as a reservist cadet, which was a two-year program. I kind of wanted to stay and never wanted to study. And I thought, you know, it's better to like not sign up for 12 years right away. And then I realized I don't like it, but I wanted to like sort of find a balance. So I, I MVP'd it, if you will, to, uh, to two years in airborne <laughs> infantry with like some officer training. And it was pretty cool. But I had a mentor that I truly admire and, um, and admired, especially back then. And at some point he came up to me and he said, look, I thought about all of this. Please don't stay longer. Uh, you're too smart for in this. In the military. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I promised you all these things, but don't do it. You'll be frustrated. Be doing great. And then when you are in your mid thirties, you will realize that all of this is way too politicized for you to have any impact and a real chance of doing something with your talent. And I just want to spare you that experience. Unfortunately, I'm not in a position to give you any other advice because I'm, uh, I've been in this army since I'm 17. <laughs> I don't know how the civilian world looks like, maybe go study or something. And I thought, oh, this was really hard for me because my whole identity was shaped around this and I was very sure about it. And I think he knew that he was the only person who could really tell me that. So I'm very thankful for it because he was right. And then I thought I'd study medicine because it's six years, so I have time to think about who I want to be. Also, they always <laughs> need doctors in the special forces, and so I could come back. Uh, I was pretty hedging the bets again, which I think is a quite an entrepreneurial mm -hmm. trait, right? You you try to always figure out a way that, that you're not locked in too much into one, one decision. I mean, I was impact-driven behind all of this. I wanted these, as you pointed out earlier, right, these very honest working environments where things are just really real and you can't like have political conversations to, to cop out. And I wanted something that is impactful. And so medicine was the obvious choice, quite didn't like it. it was, I didn't think it was very creative and memorizing a lot of things and mm -hmm. yeah, try to see many. Can, can I just yeah. highlight that you said you didn't like it, but you have three or was it four degrees? in the medical field. <laughs> well, it's, a, it's one public health degree <laughs> and then uh, okay. public policy is stepping out a bit. And then the okay. one in Cambridge was entrepreneurship, but uh, with a healthcare focus. So you're right about that. I mean, I like healthcare. So three tangential. Yeah. Leave. And Later. I stayed in healthcare for like the longest time. I mean, right now we're thinking of zooming out and generally going into like explainable AI topics where mm -hmm. stakes are high, which can also be energy or transport and so on. And I'm getting excited about it, but um, I always liked how, how real healthcare is and then how it sort of has a tangible impact. <laughs> but you're, you've got a point. Um, it's just that, you know, the, the medicine in and of itself often feels very scripted. And sometimes I felt like air control agent, you know, that you just sit there and you make sure like nothing's <laughs> yeah. screwed up, but you have to be very vigilant. Although sometimes it can be boring because much is standardized, but you have to be vigilant where things are going wrong. So yeah, I think that that's, that's probably the sentiment. Yeah, then work clinically for a little bit in lung diseases. Primarily just I really wanted to have real life experience. And that was my pitch mm -hmm. when I applied. I said, look, I don't want to be a clinician for long, but uh, I want right. to make sure that when I'm doing something else that I really understand the realities. And they, they liked that. And I had a boss who really supported me on that journey in the hospital. To, it was super helpful. And then came the moment when suddenly, you know, there were more and more offers to do something else outside. And I decided to leave. And that goes back to your initial quote then, where some doctors stopped talking to me and, and were really, oh. really deeply disappointed and said, oh, you've been bought right. by the money now. And uh, you, I thought you were on such a good track to become a real doctor. And now what, what is this? And, <laughs> you know, you, you're betraying us. You spent so much time studying. The society paid so much for yeah. you. Like, oh, the whole, the whole guilt oh thing dropped yeah. off you. Um, and that took a long time to clear out for me personally, as yeah. well as with these people who I really admired still also, right? They, they were important to me. So yeah, and then I uh, went into corporate venture building. So that's the idea that an established organization tries to become a startup or has a st like spills out a startup. And the first thing we did was in uh, a large hospital group in Germany um, or in Europe, frankly, to create a digital platform that would redefine how we connect with the patients. And we started really ambitious, had some pretty cool AI experts, was it 2018 or something like that, but then ended up killing all the AI projects and just did some mostly basic things around like patient companion apps with videos and et cetera. And I wasn't getting too excited about it and then switched into <laughs> sort of a consultancy firm that does corporate venture building, 
in the healthcare space and then we worked with different other companies helping them to also spin off things yeah and then uh left that we sold that company and since then i've been building up Hanitos. i have been working on the advisory board of a couple of startups and of a vc fund that i really love called speed invests i'm involved in a bit of m a advisory and so on so the whole spectrum frankly but mostly around healthcare as you pointed out let us know if you enjoyed this episode with a five-star rating or like. You can also find snack-sized content on our Instagram, TikTok, and LinkedIn pages, our newsletter and episode hubs live on our Substack.